Well, hello, my name is Al Meredith. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, where it is hot and hotter, but like the rest of the country, so what are you going to do? Uh, I'm calling from uh, uh, Wedgwood Baptist Church here in southwest Fort Worth, and we're preaching through a series on doctrine based on the Apostles' Creed. Please understand we're preaching from the uh, uh, authoritative Word of God, but the Apostles' Creed is the scintillation of God's Word, the essence, if you will, of what it is we believe that God's Word teaches us. I think it's important that you understand doctrine, that you know what you believe as well as why you believe, and that's why I'm spending time on this. Today we come to the section of the Apostles' Creed that talks about Jesus. We believe that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Now let me pray, and we'll get started. Holy Father, unless you teach this lesson through me, it'll be so many words. Unless you prepare the hearts of the one who are tuning in even now, O oh God, transform my heart and the hearts of all those who hear what you have to say through me from your word. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin by saying the essence of the Christian faith. If you had to summarize it up in a phrase or a sentence, what would it be? I believe the essence of the Christian faith is this. Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe that, and I believe that's what makes me a child of God. Mahatma Gandhi, when he eventually took over rulership of India and wrested India away from the British Empire, was approached by a group of missionaries who had been laboring there for decades. Gandhi had appreciated much of Christianity. He had studied at Oxford and served in South Africa. He appreciated the ethics of Jesus found in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, he appreciated especially the beauty of the hymns that Christian would speak. Well, he asked this group of missionaries to sing a hymn that, and I quote, best summarizes your faith. Well, they got their heads together and collaborated for some time, and eventually they came up with this hymn by Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Today we associate the cross with a jeweler. Necklaces and lapel pins and cufflinks, if you still wear those things. But in Jesus' day, the cross meant one thing and one thing only. It meant a cruel, shameful, torturous death. The Roman senator Cicero said the very word cross should be removed from the Roman thought, from the Roman lips. Don't ever say that word out loud. The death of crucifixion was reserved only for the vilest and most despised of criminals. But absolutely essential to the Christian faith is the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. Paul would say to the Romans, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's that essence of our faith again. Let me read Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 6. Talking about Jesus prophetically now. It says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Let me go now to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, the fullest description of the death of Christ that this talks about. The Gospel of Luke, towards the end, the 23rd chapter. And let me read... First of all, verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Down to verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, noon. 
and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. He died. Well, the Apostles' Creed said, I believe in Jesus Christ who suffered under Pontius Pilate. What's the significance of that? I, I, I've got to ask this question. What is Pontius Pilate doing here in the essence of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed? I mean, Pontius Pilate was a relatively unimportant person in the details of the death of Christ. Why bother to mention him when you've got to cut it down to the bare bones uh, of words? They include Pontius Pilate. Well, I would suggest to you that the apostles were very careful that our faith not appear as a myth, as some kind of religious story. And so by including Pontius Pilate, who was known to be governor of Judea at this time, and many extra-biblical accounts, they tied the life and now the death of Jesus Christ into historical fact. Many early religions had myths about the virgin birth, myths about death and being raised again from the grave. But what sets Christianity apart from these early religions is that it is no myth. It is a historical fact. Our faith is rooted in actuality, demonstrable historical facts, all verified people and places. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Ephrata, not just Bethlehem, because there were two Bethlehems, and the writer Luke wants us to know this is the one that's in the south near Jerusalem. During the reign of Augustus Caesar and uh, uh, during the tax that went out at that time, we know it was true. He grew up in a new city called Nazareth. He lived and ministered in the provinces of Galilee and later on Judea. He was persecuted, he was arrested, he suffered and died under the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. The Christian faith, dear people, is founded upon the person, work, and word of an historical Jesus. An historical Jesus. Uh, Not just a myth. Back in their periodic efforts to eradicate religious belief in what was then the USSR, the Soviet Union, the Communist Party that was in control for 70 years sent out secret police agents to the nation's churches one Sunday morning. One agent was struck by the heartfelt devotions of an old woman as she tearfully kissed the feet of a life-size statue of Christ on the cross. Babushka, he said, that's the Russian word for grandmother. Are you also prepared to kiss the feet of the beloved general secretary of our great communist party, Stalin? And she replied, why, of course, but only if he should die for me first. I love it. Christianity is the only faith whose God has wounds. I've said it twice already. I'll say it a third time. The essence of the faith is that Christ died for us. And what you have here, uh, theologically speaking, is a mystifying yet wonderful concept of the God who suffers with his people. The ludicrous mystery of an omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful God who chooses to suffer with us. Why? Well, one has to do with the concept of empathy. You understand empathy is different than sympathy. Sympathy sees a sad situation, clicks his tongue in consternation, shakes his head and walks away. But empathy sees a sad situation and enters into it. One of the deepest questions you will ever confront in your life is what the philosophers call the problem of pain. If God is all-powerful, and he is by definition, if he is all-loving, and he is by definition, then why do mankind suffer so? I think of one heartbroken mom on this trip last month that Ken and I went down the Danube. She was a Jewish mother, 82 years old, and they had known we were Christians, and she came to my wife, Kay, and explained to her her son that had been a doctor, and he suffered from an incurable disease that grew increasingly painful about a year ago. 
He took his own life. With tears streaming down her well-made-up faith, she cried, why would a loving God allow that? Good question. Good question. Another Jew by the name of Eli Wiesel was a boy of 15 years old when he was forced into the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz. Uh, pains me to even tell this. He tells the story of a 12-year-old boy in the camp who was helping two men hide weapons. They were discovered, and all three of them were sentenced to death, the two men and the little boy who helped him. The boy, it seemed, had a refined, beautiful face, the face, Fiso said, of a sad angel. It was a difficult thing to execute this child. The camp stoolies refused to do so, so the SS guards had to do it themselves. Three gallows were erected. All three mounted the stairs. The two men cried, long live liberty, and their necks were broken. The child said nothing, was silent. From the row of anguished spectators, all the prison prisoners lined up, came the cry from the back, <clears throat> where is God? Where is he? The chairs were tipped over. The bodies jerked and dangled limply from the ropes, but the third rope of the little boy was still twitching lightly. The boy was too light to snap his neck, and for a full 30 minutes the rope twitched as the child slowly strangled to death. As the prisoners were forced to watch, the cry went up again. Where is God now? Fiesel writes in his account, from the inside I heard a voice answered, he is here. He is hanging on this gallows. God is the God who enters into our sufferings. In Isaiah 63 verse 9, it talks about God's people suffering in Egypt and it says, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted too. That's the kind of God we worship. The Muslims worship a God they call Allah, but he is only remotely different from human suffering. And it's all chalked up to kismet, fate, it is written. Buddha is pictured with his legs crossed, his arms folded, his eyes closed, an impervious smile, and when suffering occurs, it's called karma. But the picture is most known of Jesus is lonely, abandoned, hanging in agony from a cross. The point of all this is God suffers with us because he is an empathetic God. Not only that, but he is a God who lives and dies in order to give us an example. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Peter writes and says this, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Christ suffered for us as an example of how we ought to suffer willingly for those around us. It is through the crucible of suffering that we are made more like Christ. I've said it several times, if you've been listening to me over the past few months. Willow Creek Church up in Chicago, 20,000 every weekend did an in-depth study of their members to see what was the one thing most helpful in developing their spiritual life. And it wasn't powerful preaching, although that's important. It wasn't wonderful, worshipful praise, although that's important. It wasn't dynamic, small groups. The one thing that caused more spiritual growth than anything else was suffering, trials, tribulations. It is through the crucible of suffering that we are made more Christ-like. In Psalm 34, verse 19, David writes, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. In Acts 14, 22, Paul says that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 12, he's writing from the Mamertine prison. He says, All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So when life falls apart and pain begins, unrelenting, and you're tempted to call, why me, God? Well, why not you? Did you really think you alone would be exempt from the sufferings that are used to mold and shape our character in the image of Christ? 
We believe that Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, and then it goes on to say, secondly, was crucified, dead, and buried. Now, what's this about? Well, first of all, it's about shame. No execution was more excruciatingly painful than the shameful death of crucifixion. Here was the object of heaven's glory in eternity past, stripped of every bit of human dignity, whipped beyond recognition with a cat of nine tails. That was a special Roman whip with nine thongs and pieces of bone and glass and metal at the end, so that when they laid the lash on your back, the metal and glass would tear the flesh away until finally it got down to the very bones of the rib cage. Jesus was beaten. I'm sure some of those got to his face and pulled parts of his face off to where he was unrecognizable. Public scorn. People spit on him, mocked him publicly carrying his cross down a, a street for all to see and to scorn. The Old Testament would say, Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. So not only did Jesus die, he died painfully, sufferingly, agonizingly, shamefully, but cursedly. And as we read in the passage in Luke, he breathed his last. They took his dead corpse down from the cross and buried him in a borrowed tomb. Well, his death was shameful, but it had to be for our salvation. His death, secondarily, was a substitution. And I suspect this is the most important point of the day today. He endured it all, the pain, the death, the torture, for me. I remember when the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I think Mel Gibson produced it, a very realistic depiction of the last few days of Jesus, of his trial, his beating, and his torturous death. There was a preview of it in one of the big theaters in Plano, Texas, nearby. And the evening news was interviewing people as they came out, what did you think? And there was one man in a very expensive three-piece suit. His tie was loosened. He'd come straight after work. And he was just, and they stuck a microphone and said, what do you think? And he, he could hardly speak. He just shook his head. He said, to think. He endured all that for me. And I thought, this man gets it. He knows what this is about. The theological term for this is substitutionary atonement. Let me see if I can explain that. It's the heart of the good news of the gospel. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The oldest law of the universe is that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. God had told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of that forbidden fruit, you shall surely die. Well, however long it took, eventually Eve ate, gave to her husband Adam. They both ate. Their eyes were opened. They saw that they were naked and they were ashamed. And so they covered themselves with paltry leaves. And God comes to walk them in the cool of the day, as was his habit. He says, Adam, where are you? Not that God didn't know, but that Adam would admit, well, I'm right here. And it goes on to say that God evidently killed an animal, skinned it, and covered their nakedness with the hide of that animal. Someone had to die that day, or they would have had to die that day. And so an animal was substituted in their place to spare them temporarily from death. It goes all the way down to the Passover as the children of Israel had been in Egypt as slaves for 400 years. On the night of the Passover, the angel of death passed over and, and everywhere in the households of Egypt, from the Pharaoh himself to the lowliest slave, the firstborn dies, except in the house of faithful, obedient Hebrews, who kill a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, the mantle. And God says, when I see the blood, 
I will pass over you. There was death in every household, even the Hebrew household. But in the Hebrew household, the death was substituted by the death of a lamb. As they meet around the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses began to explain how they're to worship and the National Day of Atonement is explained. They call it Yom Kippur and there a spotless lamb was taken and, and the priest would lay his hands on it, confess the sins of Israel, then slit its throat and take the blood into the holiest of holies. The only day he alone could do that, sprinkle it on the mercy seat and so the sins were covered by a substitute, substitute for them, the death of the lamb who was their substitute for their atonement. There's been much me recent resistance to this thought. Some supposedly sophisticated theologians call this slaughterhouse religion, all this talk of the blood. One denomination even went so far as to remove all the hymns that mention the blood of Jesus. That denomination, by the way, is struggling deeply today. But guys, it is only the power of the blood that can atone for my sin and for yours. Only the blood. And only the power of Jesus shed blood. When I place my faith and trust in that event 2,000 years ago, that can transform me. Just before I came here to Fort Worth, what? 33, four years ago. I heard the story, and Harold Morris, who had a prison ministry, telling about a man named Michael Godwin who was on death row in Columbia, South Carolina. He learned he's only 20 years old, but he's the most dangerous criminal in the whole state. He's an animal. Everyone calls him Bam Bam because he hits folks. Bam Bam, and his lights out. The security is so tight around him that even the guards are searched. Violent. Well, Harold Morris, who had a prison ministry, found out it was due to a deep anger. Reputedly, he was abused as a boy by every significant adult in his life. He burned his house down when he was five years old. He was put in a reformatory at seven, an asylum at nine, drugs, shock therapy, reform school, prison, and now death row for rape and murder. And Harold Morris decided he was going to love this man into the kingdom. After months and months of demonstrating God's love to him over and over again, caring visitation, he told him eventually of God's love for him through Christ. Michael Godwin, of all people, turned his heart and his life over to Jesus Christ who died for him. He went on to get his GED. Then he enrolled in Columbia Bible College, graduated, got a B.A. in English from the University of South Carolina, then a master's in counseling, all while on death row. Twice he was selected as one of the ten most outstanding men in South Carolina, witnessing for Christ in the Columbia State Prison, utterly transformed. What can do that? Nothing but the blood of Jesus has that kind of power to transform an unreformable criminal and the most outstanding man in the state of South Carolina. Substitution. Until you discover that beneath all of this theology, there is a personal invitation to you to accept what Christ did on Calvary. What I'm saying is just so many words. You have got to make it personal, realized, like the man walking out of the theater in Plano, it was for me. The old hymn, was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree, yes. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. A man, I'm told, once had a deeply disturbing dream. He had fallen down a deep, dark well and was sinking into the mire and couldn't get out. And in his dream, Confucius came and peered over the well down to him and said, if you'd only obeyed my teachings, you would never be there. And Confucius walked off. Muhammad came and he said, it's just kismet, it's fate, you get what you deserve. Buddha came and peered imperviously over the edge of the well and said, cease struggling, just meditate, empty your mind, and it won't matter if you die down there. In his dream, he said, then Jesus came 
and climbed down into the well where I was, buried in the mire, picked me up and carried me to the service, washed me, gave me clean clothes, and invited me to follow him. That's what I'm talking about today. The heart of our faith is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Frank Gohanovitz was a Polish Jew who was rounded up with his wife and family and shipped off to Auschwitz like so many cattle to work eventually and die as part of Hitler's final solution. He wasn't Jewish, he was a Catholic priest. Two and a half million Jews died there at Auschwitz. Tons of human hair were shaved off the dead bodies to stuff the mattresses of the Third Reich. There at Auschwitz was a man named Maximilian Kolb, who was also a Polish Jew, but a Christian. Kahanovich was Jewish. Maximilian Kolb was Jewish, but he was a Christian Jew. In fact, a Franciscan priest. In the harshness of Auschwitz, he, remain, he maintained somehow his gentle spirit. He shared his food. He gave up his bunk. He prayed for his captors. He was known as the Saint of Auschwitz. In July of 1941, one prisoner escaped from Auschwitz. In retaliation, they called all the prisoners out, lined them out, and gave the announcement every tenth prisoner should step forward and they would be singled out to die in an isolation cell where they'd be giving no food or water, starved to death. Bleakly, they counted off every tenth man was doomed. The last count fell upon Frank Gahanovitz. As he was forced to step forward, he sobbed. He said, my wife and my children who were there with him. Suddenly, Maximilian Kolb stepped forward. He raised his hand and loudly said, I want to talk to the commander. I want to take this poor man's place. I am old. I'm tired. He is young and he's still able to work. Stunned silence. The commandant finally said, request granted. Now prisoners are not allowed to speak. In his diary, Frank Ahanovitz said, I could only thank him with my eyes. I was stunned. I, the command, condemned, am to live, and someone else unwill or rather willingly and voluntarily offers his life for a stranger. Is this some dream? Well, as they were dying in their solitary cells where they couldn't even turn around or sit down, Kolb outlived all the others who were forced to die. In this agonizing death cell, he only died after the camp doctor injected phenol into his heart a month later. Every year to this day, Gahanovitz goes back to Auschwitz to say thank you to the man who died in his place. Frank Gahanovitz will never be the same. Every time, every day, I come before the Lord to share my hearts and dreams and needs. I come with thanksgiving that I am there before Almighty God because of what His Son Jesus Christ did for me. Suffered and died. Crucified and buried for me. Oh God, eternity will not be long enough to thank you as you deserve for this unbelievable, unspeakable love. Thank you, thank you for loving the likes of me. Give each one listening in the faith to believe that you died for them as well. And may it transform them from the inside out, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God bless.